Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for joining this webinar. Welcome. This is a free webinar organized by our team here at Pine Biotech. The webinar will cover several topics from the upcoming biomedical data science program, and we'll be launching this program September 16th. In this webinar, we will be looking at the program details. We'll learn about biomedical data and see several examples of data processing, visualization, and analysis. The omics logic programs are designed to cover important topics and cutting edge technologies related to biomedical research, clinical analytics, and industry R&D. In these programs, we cover topics like genomics, transcriptomics, metagenomics, epigenomics, and machine learning for biomedical data. The omics logic program is focused on the data science aspect of biomedical data analysis and deals with technical skills and application of data science principles to high throughput biomedical data. You can register for the upcoming program and attend these introductory webinars to learn about the topics we will cover, see examples of the activities that we will hold, and ask any questions you might have. So to register for the program, you have to first fill out the form on this link. And then after you fill out this form, you will be receiving information about how you can register for the actual program. So you can see the landing page right here. And uh, I, I'll just paste this link in chat for everybody to take a look. Of course, most of you have already filled out the, the, um, the form down here at the bottom. But just to explain the process itself, once your information is recorded, we will be sending out invitations to attend these webinars. And then we will also send out more information about the program. And if you have missed any webinar, we will share that video with you. In this webinar, we will start introducing biomedical data analysis techniques and approaches that you can master and adopt to help you conduct better research and learn about how data science is changing the whole biomedical research field from diagnosis to treatment selection and even development of new therapeutics. Specifically, we will look at high throughput biomedical data, different types of data and different analysis methods. And we will see how you can effectively utilize technical tools like Excel, the TBioInfo platform, and even R to solve challenges typical to research and industry environments. We also want to share with you information and a preview of our upcoming course that will cover the most important aspects of high throughput biomedical data analysis, combining reproducible workflows with machine learning methods and visualization approaches for various high throughput biomedical data sets. So this program again will start on September 16th, and these free webinars before the program will help cover some of the topics and show how we will conduct the program. If you have any questions, we will answer those questions. So for example, somebody is asking, do we need to know any language like R beforehand? No, you do not need to know anything before. Of course, it's beneficial to know some molecular biology. I think it's important to kind of have a sense of what type of biomedical challenges there are. Uh, and uh, be able to manipulate tables in uh, software like Excel. But beyond that, you really don't need to know anything. This is going to start at a very low introductory level, and we will together walk through uh, these different methods and applications and learn together how to effectively uh, do the bare minimum to actually get some insights from data. This program, uh, is uh, organized uh, by a skilled team uh, of experts that have a diverse perspective on the challenges and methods that we will be covering. Uh, Darko Medin is uh, a data scientist and biostatistician. Uh, Mohit Mazumdar holds a PhD in bioinformatics and has worked for several years in the industry applying machine learning to big biomedical data. And my name is Ilya Brodsky. I'm one of the co-founders of Pine Biotech. Our company is working closely with research and industry partners to develop technology solutions for big data and omics integration. So what we will do in this course is introduce you to some of the tools that we have developed and some of the tools that are commonly used both in industry and in research. But just to tell you a little bit more about the company, 
You can go to this link, pinebiotech.com, and look at our story to learn more about our team. And you can also look at the websites of the Tauber Bioinformatics Research Center, which is a bioinformatics research center at University of Haifa in Israel. And our company is a technology transfer company that came out of that center. Essentially, we have access to the expertise that they have and also to a lot of the algorithms and workflows that they have been developing there over the course of the past 10 to 15 years with a large group of experts uh, working primarily in bioinformatics. So let's talk about the program itself, making sense of data. So what kind of data are we talking about? What can we do with this data? And what is the purpose of knowing how to manage and analyze this kind of data? How can we understand data, especially large quantities of data that do not make sense right away? So here we'll talk about two important data science principles. Data visualization as a way to communicate human intelligence and machine learning artificial intelligence. As you know, data science is already impacting many industries. For example, data visualization can be an important technique utilized by decision makers that need to decide on marketing, revenue generation, or financial market trends. To make a decision about return on investment, ROI, from advertising, one can simply look at the number of impressions from ads and pick the ads consistently delivering the information to the target audience. So what you see is a heat map and the darker the square, the more impressions. And you can see this across the whole week and how you can compare ROI. Well, if you're paying for impressions, obviously the darker ad set, the more effective it is. So as a decision maker, if I need to maximize revenue, I'm going to pick, just based on the visual representation of data, this ad set. Also in financial markets, if we have good visualization of financial information that we can gain from markets, if this information is accurate and up to date, we can easily compare different currencies and we can select which currency produces long-term value. A different visualization, this is a bar plot, and we can see that the scale is very different. Here we were talking about a week scale, here we're talking a whole year. And we can use simple elements like a threshold. It's not very visible here, but there's a red line, and that is a threshold that can demonstrate to me what has a long-term change and what has a short-term change. So as a financial decision maker, I can make decisions about capital gains utilizing effective visualization. So this kind of visualization ultimately helps us deal with large quantities of data and make better decisions. What about biomedical data visualization? Well, a simple biomedical data source is the heart rate. So here we can see a cardiogram. And in this cardiogram, we can easily spot a trend, but we also can spot abnormalities. So something that stands out to us right away. But as we extend this data set, now this information is more difficult to spot. And you can imagine if we continuously have this heart rate without constantly looking at the cardiogram, it is very difficult to spot these kinds of abnormalities. So how can we translate this type of data into data that is more informative? One way to do this is to look at a different scale, transform this data into a completely different scale to make the trends associated with information that we can intuitively understand. So here you can see, first of all, a scale that does not include the individual heart rate, the heart, heartbeat, but actually shows us something that happened over several hours. As we look at this different scale, we can start associating this information with a story. So this is actually heart rate during marriage proposal. 
And now we can see this whole story unfold. Here, somebody is walking in Colosseum, buying ice cream, enjoying ice cream, walking forwards, started proposing silently, started proposing using words, finally getting this exciting answer, yes, peak of happiness, and then reverting to normal heart rate that the person had before the marriage proposal. This demonstrates that some biomedical data can be almost instantly informative when it is appropriately visualized. Selecting the right criteria for visualization and adding other information into the visualization that we have produces the result that we are interested in. So why are these data science techniques important in the biomedical field? Well, first of all, a lot of the biomedical field is turning towards data-driven insight. Instead of deep knowledge of every single aspect of biomedical research that we're engaged in, we are flooded with information that comes in raw data format. And to produce insight from that raw data, you have to utilize data science principles. Another big aspect of it is reproducibility. We cannot just rely on stochastic events or technical variation and knowing how to adjust for those elements, we can make our experiments, our data, and our analysis results more reproducible. It's also easier to combine context and make it more easy to compare between different conditions, different situations, and different data types. We also have to consider rapid prototyping. Many times we will get a lot of raw data from different sources and quickly have to estimate what we are looking for, what kind of trends exist in the data, what kind of comparisons to make, and ultimately how do we communicate this information to our peers, collaborators, and even buyers in the sense, people that make decisions about our research, people making decisions about hiring us, people making decisions about the data that they would like to generate to confirm or prove a hypothesis that we have generated. To do that, a lot of times, we can simplify the process between raw data and informative visualization that somebody else can interpret by making programmable visualizations. And we'll talk about that in this program as well. Now, Let's talk about high throughput experiments. What we've seen until now are examples of data that is already somewhat intuitive. We can visualize it and connect it to a phenotype, and that makes sense. But with high throughput experiments, there are new challenges and new opportunities. So to jump into that, let's talk a little bit about the history of genomic data. So as you all know, in the 1950s, DNA structure was discovered. And quickly after that, a lot of excitement around the human genome, which was assembled between 90s and 2003, and ultimately gave rise to new type of information. This genomic information transformed the NIH, and many different companies popped up that utilized this data for a variety of different biomedical challenges. But with the coming of Illumina sequencing, the shotgun sequencing, we saw a dramatic drop in the cost of sequencing, of next generation sequencing. And therefore, in 2015, we already had the 1000 Genomes Project pu published. And in 2018, we're not talking about a single human genome, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of human genomes. With this amount of information, the challenge is now different. The challenge is to link the disease symptoms, the phenotypes, the clinical phenotypes, the clinical data, with a variety of omic data or multi-omic data. Because today, we are seeing more and more projects that are collecting data from uh, different levels of omics, helping us re, um, reclassify different diseases, understand better the clinical symptoms that we ultimately are looking for. So this medical data is the type of information that we gather from clinical tests, diagnostic labs, and 
we want to link that data with this molecular level of detail. Genomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, microbiome, etc. So let's take a look at an example. Here's an example, a publication that we see uh, used data from cell lines where they generated multiple levels of omics, genomic data, transcriptomic data, epigenomic data, and combine that with two types of phenotypes. One is a clinical subtype of these different breast cancer cell lines, or in this case, actually, it's a pan cancer data set, and GA50, growth inhibition of these cells in response to different treatments typical to chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and other cancer drugs. The result was using machine learning. So you can see here random forest and support vector machines to predict based on molecular class, predict the response to a treatment. Now this is prototyping where we are essentially trying to prove the idea that we can use multiple levels of molecular data to accurately predict a personalized treatment selection of drugs for patients, for cancer patients. Let's take a look at some aspects of this project using some hands-on practical examples. So first part is processing this data. These are huge data sets. We're talking about hundreds of gigabytes of data that all come in FASTQ files, files that contain multiple short reads from each sample. And the first challenge, like you will find in many of these biomedical uh, situations, is to process the data, prepare this data for analysis. In this program, we will look at how we can easily process data like this, understanding every step, and learning how to create pipelines, bioinformatics pipelines, that take the raw data and produce tables or matrices that we will then use for visualization and for analysis. So these are the links. You can take a look. Uh, the link for the platform is server.t-bio.info. And you will see there these areas of analysis. In these areas of analysis, we will focus on the transcriptomic section. The transcriptomic section will help us process next generation sequencing data and produce quantified levels of gene expression. Let's take a look. So we will go to server.t-bio.info. And if you go there, you will see something like this. Okay, hovering over each section, you can learn about each one of these sections, and essentially you will see a consistent interface in each one of these sections. So here we have RNA-seq data, here we have single cell transcriptome, we have chip-seq data, genomic data, mutation variant data, and other types of analyses that you can perform. Once you get an account, and a part of this program will provide you with an account where you can run your own analyses and also learn about these different sections. Once you have your account, you will be able to log in and utilize the demo section just to understand what steps are included in processing this kind of data. So let's take a look. Here I'm in the demo section. We won't go into the type of inputs and how to set this pipeline up, but just to demonstrate some of the steps. As we start, you already know the main steps that are included in processing this large data set. You have to pre-process the data where we remove additional trimming of adapters, removing PCR duplicates, mapping on the genome, and then quantification of expression levels. As you can see now, only the next steps that are appropriate for my data are going to light up. So I can start with pre-processing. Trimomatic removes the adapters. PCR clean helps eliminate the PCR amplification. Then I will actually map my 
reads on the transcriptome. So you can see here that the reads will be aligned to exons of genes. And then I will create a table of expression, a table that will look like this. It will have genes listed right here and samples listed as columns. Let's click on end. And each step of this pipeline is much more in depth explained. Over here, you can click on this link. Let's uh, not go there right now. So you can learn about each one of those steps much more in detail. Click OK. And we have expression data. So a table of expression. You can just click and download it right here. And let's take a look at what's inside. What we have inside, as we saw, is a matrix. A matrix means that it has rows and columns, and inside it has continuous data. So this is called gene expression. Let's look at how many genes we have. We have just close to 7,000 genes. So let me go back to the presentation and continue from here. So as you saw, we used this platform and created a bioinformatics pipeline that helped us transform the raw reads into a table. So we created this pipeline. We did pre-processing. We did alignment to the reference genome and then quantification. And as a result, we got this table of expression. The table of expression shows us how between different subtypes of breast cancer, different genes are expressed. Now, how can we deal with this data? We have 20 to 60,000 genes per sample. In that case, we saw already a filtered table of 7,000 genes, but originally you would be looking at thousands and thousands of genes per sample. But also we have tens to hundreds of samples. The era when we looked at two or three samples per condition is over. <coughs> Today, almost any project is going to have multiples of tens for each condition. And we have a lot of this data available on public domain data sets. So for example, NCBI, as correctly mentioned in the chat, or you even generate this data yourself. And there are other repositories. And we will cover some of those repositories and project examples. But the problem is that there are very complex relationships here between each sample and between each gene. Just by looking at the table, it's non-trivial how to explain this type of information. How do you interpret it? What does it mean about these different cancer types? So let's take a look at how we can leverage data exploration and visualization for this table to use supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques and helps, uh, help us extract some meaning from this table. So essentially what we will try to do is take a look at the samples. In this representation, you can see a scatter plot of different subtypes of cancer. And here we can easily spot a trend, right? We can see that there is a group right here and another group right here, so at least two groups. That is already very important insight. So let us take a look at how we can uh, perform such an analysis quickly, and then we will dig into that analysis and understand a little bit better how we can recreate the analysis ourselves. So let's go back to areas of analysis, and we'll start with unsupervised analysis. Now we will upload that same data set that we just looked at. Press on continue. And we will use PCA, principal component analysis, using an R script. So then we will look at the script itself, understand how it works, and modify some things to make an even better uh, representation of our data. So we'll take this PCA R library, we will produce a scatter plot, and we have several inputs here that we can take a look at. 
let's click on end and I will give this a name PCA R library cell lines breast cancer 7000 genes and let's run this pipeline now the pipeline is very simple we just load in the data we launch an R script and then we produce the result now we will look at the result and we will see what would this result actually look like and how do we manipulate this result further so let's take a look at a pipeline i just finished before this session and here we have a pdf file that shows us a visual result so let's take a look okay so now we transformed our whole data of 7000 genes and 53 samples that we took we will see that there are two major groups right here's one and we can see down here this is luminal so luminal subtype and then here we have the other subtypes but there's clearly some other groups as well but maybe we cannot easily distinguish between them the other thing that this pipeline provides us is a downloadable zip file with an R script. So let us take a look at this R script and see what does it actually contain. So here I am in R Studio. We will go through some of the details about R Studio uh, and how to set it up, how to make sure that you have the most up-to-date version and how you can install all the libraries needed for this analysis. But let us look at two simple sections of the script loading the data <clears throat> you can see that i'm loading cell lines expression data marked and then you can see <coughs> sorry you can see that i am loading the data and transforming it into a matrix that now i can take information from and then make the visualization so now you can see drawing pca plot and you can see some of the settings so let us look at how does this actually work. We will run the script and let's change this. Okay, let's just change it to PCA. So we will produce uh, an image, PCA.png. Let's run this again. And now after we have created this simple image, you can see it appears right here. We can click on that. Okay, and this is what we see, right? So we've changed some things instead of looking at uh, different colors we have here uh, the names of the sample subtypes and we have these arrows right these are called loadings and you can see that each loading has a name it has the name of a gene let's take and make it a little bit more interesting something like this so first of all we will change the file so we take a file that contains the labels also, not just the expression data. And also here, you will see how some of this functionality will start working differently just by loading a different type. Sorry, let's call this PCA1. Okay, let's run this again. Now, a very simple change. We just took a data set that contains a little bit more information. And let's look at the result. Okay, now the result is much more interesting. The result is much more interesting because now the groups are also colored, right? So now we can see the color of the group, which cell subtype, breast cancer subtype this is. And also you can see the groups of other uh, subtypes are circled. So it's easier to differentiate. And indeed, there is some difference between these groups as well. How do I know? Well, PCA shows us variants. It shows us variants, and you can see that PC1 represents 18% of the variants, and PC2, 12% of the variants. So if this represents about 20% of the variants, the fact that they are in different X location on this X axis means that there is some separation. Now there's a lot more that we can do with this data. Let's quickly look at how we can transform and select certain genes out of this whole data set 
and make an even more clear separation between these groups. So let us go and we will now take a look at a different table. And I have to set this as my working directory. And now I have to change cell lines, 15 genes marked. Okay, and let, let's keep this PCA1. We will run the file and you can see PCA1. Okay, now we have a much better representation of these different groups. So you can see how all of a sudden they separate and the information that we have about loadings is much more clearly interpretable. In fact, what we can now see, the direction of this arrow corresponds to the direction of variance. So we can see, and by the way, the question here is, use of RStudio will be explained in this course. Yes, just as I'm demonstrating here, we'll do a lot of exercises like this. This is just one example where we will look at RStudio packages that can help us produce meaningful visualizations and improve upon the visualizations, the standard visualizations that you get um, out, of this, uh, out of this session. Okay, so now you could see how we took a large data set, 7,000 genes, 53 cell lines. We produced a simple visualization and we saw some major trend, separation into sample groups. After that, we selected some specific genes. Okay, so we saw essentially how, how this type of information um, can be used to analyze high throughput data. Now, the high throughput data that we looked at, we just took dimensionality reduction. You can see here a good representation of PCA. It's essentially like twisting my whole data set until I get a clear enough picture that helps me separate between the samples. Now, we will also look at these other uh, methods that we have here, clustering methods, as well as supervised uh, classification methods that fall under the category of machine learning. So in this course, what we will do is we will start by understanding the projects. The projects range from cancer to resistance, microbial resistance to antibiotics and tuberculosis to other types of projects with a clear biomedical challenge. We will then learn the logic of going from raw data to data that we can look at and we can analyze and we can visualize. And then we will go into the technical detail. We will take a look at our studio. We will take a look at other types of uh, libraries, not just the one that we saw today and we will learn how to understand and how to modify the scripts. So ultimately, you will be able to leverage the big data environment that we have to process, rapidly process big data. Then you will be able to download that data, download those methods, and modify them on your computer. So improving those results and making sure that we go from something that is somewhat interesting, which is called data mining. We start spotting some trends. And then ultimately to classification and feature selection, which is a use of machine learning to find a gene set, in this case, that could be used as a predictive classifier. And ultimately, we will understand how it works, the internal working of this method, what principles are used to select those genes, and how do we correlate between what we see in this kind of a visual representation with what it actually means? So here you can see this is a gene, right? We talked about loadings a little bit. So this is a gene. And this gene, if you just plot its expression, you can see right here that the expression level <coughs> corresponds with what we see in this picture. Because this line, the direction of this line, is longest that separates between this and the rest, right? And here you can see that this is high expression and this is luminal data. So this all is luminal and these are all the rest of them. 
And we'll also see how this type of information can help us prepare classification of the whole data set so that we can better understand what's going on and create reproducible models. So this is again just an example, but I want to cover some other things that we will look at during this program. So as I mentioned, we will take a look at biomedical challenges. The whole biomedical field is now being both challenged and uh, it's presented with an opportunity to leverage these large and very precise molecular data sets to navigate this whole area of disease, therapeutic intervention into the disease, early detection of disease, an understanding of targets, how do these molecular mechanisms work, how are they altered, and how they can be adjusted by external, um, external uh, impact. But we will look at it specifically from the data side. So we are going to look at how we can leverage tools and data science principles to adapt to this new kind of a, a dimension where so much data and it's so detailed and we have to extract meaningful insights. Then we will look at data processing. So here you can see this is data processing, a series of lessons where we can take a look at the properties of data, the statistical properties of data, the data, uh, the data distribution, variance, various technical uh, things that impact the different types of data that we have, different types of data, continuous, categorical, um, and others. And we will look at how to understand the data from a statistical perspective to make decisions in the way we set up our next steps. For example, the principal component analysis that we just did was done on data that was transformed to log normal uh, distribution because specifically gene expression does not follow normal distribution out of the box when we just process. So therefore we need to do log transformation and prepare the data by also leveraging tools like quantile normalization. So we'll talk about why and how and practically see examples of where these types of data processing and data cleaning and data preparation techniques are going to be very powerful in terms of the types of outcomes and the types of insights that you can get out of them. Then we will take a look at data mining. Once we have a lot of this data, once we have so much access on NCBI, on TCGA, on all of these big data repositories where we have thousands of samples, thousands of genomes, how can we mine this data? Essentially, learning from the data itself, understanding what can this data tell us. Once we understand what the data can tell us, now we can come up with a very specific question. And that question, a lot of times, can be transformed into a model. And so then, the last part, we will talk about classification. We'll talk about using machine learning methods preparing different types of methods, making sure that these methods produce reproducible results, and we will look at how these machine learning uh, models could be trained to give us prediction about new types of data and how we can test and validate that that is actually true. Now, I see a lot of you are having questions about what types of data will we deal with. So essentially, we will deal with data science principles which data set you will apply those principles to is up to you. We will teach you about preparing the data, any type of data. You can take raw data and process it, but ultimately all of these methods are gonna work with tables. And those tables could be tables of expression, tables of uh, amount of mutations in a gene sequence. They could be copy number variation. They could be number of uh, epigenetic peaks uh, in chip seek or methylation of DNA. So you can look at many different data types, but also we'll touch on non-omics in the standard word, uh, meaning of that word. We will look at data that is more clinical. For example, how can we link 
expression of genes with age or with a risk factor or for example uh, ethnic background right so we'll look at a variety of data types that we will try to understand by looking at these visualizations and correlations and also learning about the underlying statistics of these methods how do we understand this Lo looking at p-values looking at distribution looking at variance looking at all of these different aspects to really know how to apply these methods, not out of the box, not just as they come, but with understanding. So this data set, this uh, program, will start on September 16th, and we call it Biomedical Data Simplified, because what we will try to do is we will try to use all of these omics data, data sets, high throughput data, big data, and apply data science principles, how to process the data and prepare it for analysis, how to use machine learning to explore the data, train models, and how to leverage visualization and make the data insights communicatable, but also insightful to ourselves. The Omics Logic program, just to summarize, will cover the following topics. Methods for high throughput data processing, analysis, and visualization. Applying these methods to clinical, research and pharmaceutical projects. And here we will also talk about what kinds of challenges are cutting edge, are most important. If you're looking to leverage this program to make your resume stand out, what kind of a project do you want to add to your resume if you're looking to be hired by a pharmaceutical company or by a clinical research organization? If you're a student, how can you leverage data science to make a bigger impact on your field in the domain of research, whether it be infectious diseases, neuroscience, oncology, biotechnology, et cetera. If you are a researcher yourself, we'll talk about different types of research uh, practices that will make your data analysis more reproducible, that will help you incorporate more variety and more data into your research, so that you gain some preliminary research results that you can apply for grants and you can start collaborations. Again, we are focused on making sure that these skills are going to be useful for you, whatever domain you are in, and we are going to make sure that those that are consistent and can go through all of these sections will benefit from very practical skills. And finally, we will help you understand the biomedical research and read publications critically. A lot of publications are coming out that use machine learning, that use these visualization techniques. It's not always clear why they chose one method over the other or why they decided to show their results in this way or another way. So we will go through some of these examples and decipher how exactly these decisions are made and what makes an impactful representation and what is not an input impactful representation and finally you will obtain a certificate of completion of this course so all of you uh, will follow a specific schedule that we'll go over right now that you can um, by attending all of the sessions and completing all of the assignments in the sessions will give you a way to uh, get a certificate of completion so what is the schedule as we said, we will start on September 16th, and that whole week, 16th to the 20th, will be an introduction. We'll talk about high throughput data experiments. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What are some of these omics technologies, genomics, transcriptomics, and some of the other ones? How do we apply this to the domain of precision medicine, molecular data, or drug discovery? So we'll talk about these topics and uh, it, we will meet a couple of times during this week and also introduce you to some of the resources where you can learn on your own and understand these things in more detail based on where your interest lies. Then we will talk about exploratory data analysis. So September 24th to October 4th, we'll talk about descriptive statistics, data preparation, probability, correlation, and association common data visualization techniques in Excel and R. Then between October 10th and, and uh, 18th, sorry, 7th and 18th, we will talk about data mining. 
how do we leverage these methods of dimensionality reduction, like principal component analysis? How do we understand features and objects? How do we use filtering, normalization, and log transformation? What are the types of clustering methods that we will typically apply? Why do we use hierarchical clustering or k-means or other dimen dimension-based uh, uh, clustering? How do we understand when to use what and what problems are going to be solved? And then between October, to, uh, October 21st and the 31st, so by the end of October, we will look at classification, discriminant analysis, including stepwise LDA, LDA, and those types of discriminant analyses, decision trees and random forest. What is random forest? How can we modify random forest to produce more reliable results? And then we'll talk about efficiency. How do we leverage support vector machines and classification like that? So this program, again, is a, about two months long, month and a half, maybe closer to two months. We will meet at least twice a week. Uh, we, our team will be available to interact with you one-on-one -on -one and help you address specific challenges. You will find a lot of additional resources that we will provide as a part of our educational ecosystem. And also it's a way to get new connections in the industry and in research. If you're a researcher, if you're a student, if you're working in industry, <coughs> we will, <coughs> sorry, we will make sure that you are familiar with our team with our network and also between each other, we will facilitate collaborative projects. So if you find an opportunity to work together, we will help you work together and make the most out of this time. A question, will this course cover some aspects uh, already covered in precision oncology? So for those of you that are already familiar with our other omics logic programs, we run six different omics logic programs throughout the year including introduction to T-BioInfo, the platform, the environment, the bioinformatics uh, challenges and opportunities. We run a program on genomics, on transcriptomics, metagenomics, uh, epigenomics, and this is a program focused on data science. Only in this program, we will talk about more technical level. How do you incorporate the biostatistical principles and the machine learning algorithms? How do you code in R? How do you set up the R environment? So none of those things are actually covered in most of the other programs. Most of the other programs are focused on data types and data processing and inference. Okay, so let's turn to some of the questions. The questions are, what is the registration fee? How do we register? What are we going to cover, et cetera? So again, we will be sending out more emails following this webinar. We will hold another webinar also on September 10th, and we will be uh, reaching out to you uh, about registration. So the registration is $200 for the whole program. There are discounts available for students and researchers that are going to leverage the things that we learn in this uh, course. Um, and we will guide you through those details um, based on your background and based on the submission of the form that you are going to be uh, submitting on the, um, on the landing page. Uh, just briefly, um, if you see an email uh, with biomedical data simplified or hands-on biomedical data science, that is an email from us. If you want to reach out to us, you can contact us and we will be happy to either schedule a call, one-on-one -on -one call. Uh, we have a whole team here on chat, but also in our team in India and in the US. You can easily reach us, and we would love to talk to you and understand uh, if you have any questions or if you need any assistance with any part of this. Um, so I, uh, again, want to urge you to stay in touch with us and look out for uh, some of these coming emails. And join us again September 10th. September 10th, we will have another webinar, and we will talk a little bit more in depth about some of the project examples that we will cover. Uh, based on the discussion today and based on how we will be uh, conducting the program.